Um, I'm Eric Rose. I'm the chairman of this task. Uh, first of all, thanks for everyone's time this afternoon. We really appreciate you being here. Um, I've had the pleasure of working alongside some really talented people from all over Ohio uh, on this task force, and uh, it's been my pleasure to, to chair this, this task force. So uh, just to give a little background for those of you that maybe aren't familiar, um, we're, we're AIO Ohio. I know we have some guests on the phone that maybe aren't architects or aren't uh, associated with, with the building industry. So uh, AI Ohio is a uh, it's a multifaceted organization, but one of the things we do is advocate um, and, and reach out and do, do public outreach. So this is a kind of a multi-pronged opportunity for us to, to show our value to the community um, in a very real way uh, in response to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So our efforts on this was really focused toward um, learning environments, schools, uh, specifically in Ohio, and what architects can maybe do to help uh, with the effort to get schools uh, safe and back to normal for the students. So the idea was to uh, kind of make a call to architects all over the state, get some ideas going. Um, and we did that about a month ago. And then we had a midterm review where we, we shared some of our thoughts with um, some leaders in our community of architects uh, just to kind of refine our thoughts. And today we've narrowed that down to five uh, final concepts that we're going to share with you all. And uh, we welcome your input. These are you know, final in that they are complete for today, but they're part of an ongoing conversation. Uh, so we welcome thoughts from, from the group uh, at large, and um, we're excited to, to hear what you have to say. Um, so we have five groups again today uh, from all over the state, some students, I believe, some professionals, uh, folks that work on school. So it's going to be a nice, uh, broad approach to, to see this. So um, Kate, Brunswick is going to help us with our timing, so we're going to try to keep this uh, concise. I know mean, it's Friday; it's a beautiful day out in Cleveland, anyways. So we want to be respectful of your time. Uh, Kate, anything that I'm forgetting to mention here? No, I I think you covered it, uh, Eric. I think we're ready, I, and I'll let as people continue to join, I'll just let them in. Um, people can use the chat if they want to send a message to everybody involved, um, but uh, after each presentation, and there are five today, we will have time for questions and answers. So you can put a question in the chat or you can just wait and unmute yourself after um, a presentation to ask questions. Excellent. Okay, so uh, our first group we have is uh, Molly McNally and she has a partner with her, but they're going to, uh, going to start us off. So go ahead, guys. Sure thing. Okay. Um, Kate, it actually says that, that the host disabled screen sharing, so if you don't mind. How's that? Mm, let's see. Still says I can't do it. <laughs> Yikes. All right, there we go. Okay. We are all good. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking your time this afternoon to hear our ideas. We're very excited to be talking with all of you. Um, my name is Julia Bolin, and I am a rising third year architecture student at Miami University. Um, hello, all. My name is Molly McNally, and I'm also a rising junior architecture major at Miami University. Just wanted to thank each of you um, very much for taking the time to come join us today, and we're very excited to share our thoughts with you and, and kind of hear your feedback. Um, so when first approaching this project, Julie and I began to think about the daily life of students and how they're going to interact in school throughout the day. And in order to minimize the spread of COVID-19, we thought it was best to separate students at the grade wide level, as well as the individual classroom levels um, with controlled internal circulation routes, as you can see in the diagram above here. Um, and while this, we found that this was beneficial for the overall safety of the students, we soon realized that this would um, result in a loss of many activities bringing us to the conclusion that students' individual desk space um, in their own classroom was gonna become the center of both academic and social life in schools. So we wanted to focus on reimagining um, existing classroom items to create a student-centered desk design um, that maintains many aspects of the current classroom environment to ensure that when students walk in, they're still um, comfortable and feel that sense of safety in these uncertain times. 
Yes, another one of our original ideas was to create an outdoor classroom. Um, and this would enhance the students' educational experience by providing them with um, increased educational opportunities and physical activities while still promoting the idea of sustainability. So in our final individual desk design, the um, idea of sustainability is still a very main focus, um, but we instead brought this into the classroom to enhance their individual desk experience instead of a larger scale outdoor classroom. Um, so when we approached this for the second time, we began to kind of think about the items in a classroom that may not be used anymore as a result of COVID and how um, we could bring our attention to classroom furniture and community items that now no longer really have a purpose in the classroom um, and how we could repurpose these to create spaces and facilitate social distancing. Um, and despite younger students' best intentions, I know there's a great fear that many of them would not always be following social distancing guidelines. So we wanted to create a layout that would naturally enforce these safety measures um, through the strategic placement of those existing classroom items that Julie had mentioned. Um, and since many schools are considering um, running classrooms at half or just less than full capacity, we elected to place two desks together in an L-shaped formation um, to give students more space to work, as we said before, that school life now is going to center around their own personal areas. Um, these additional desks will also create um, another physical barrier between them that aids in maintain these, maintaining um, this recommended six-foot distance without feeling as though they are miles apart from their peers. And as so much of our lives have changed during this time, we want students, um, when they walk into the classroom again, for it to feel as normal as possible. Um, so here is another representation of the relationship between the desks. So students still have access to bookshelves, which will be used as barriers between the desks. Um, and then the class, or the desks are still in a familiar classroom configuration with some opportunities for interaction and somewhat of a familiar environment that students can still relate to. So um, in order to keep these solutions feasible for the upcoming school year, we really centered the design around making modifications to these existing classroom items. Um, for the safety of the students and teachers, um, plexiglass guards would be installed around the perimeter of each student's space. These would also function as dry erase boards to help replicate the dynamics of group work without physically coming in contact with one another as they can still look and see and, and write and kind of, like we said, have that interaction with, with their desk mate. Um, these boards would be installed with an adjustable bracket as shown in the image of your upper left. And this allows the plexiglass to be easily installed and removed without any, um, causing any permanent damage to the desk. And along the same lines of hardware thoughts, um, students will be provided with C clamps that they can place around the desk um, to store their personal belongings to eliminate the gathering around like a centralized cubby system at the beginning and end of the day and prevent um, their personal items such as backpacks, coats, et cetera, um, from touching. And then another small piece that I'll explain a little bit more on the next slide is there will be a movable piece of particle board that's attached to the front of the desk. Um, so this diagram here kind of shows how this contraption would work. So in a post-COVID um, school, administrators are trying to really minimize the mixing of groups. And we realized that this lack of movement throughout the day results in the loss of many special activities that are integral to um, students' education, such as art and music. So we wanted to provide and design an additional element that would help facilitate these activities at their own desks. So pegs would be installed along the front edge of the desk where the piece of particle board, um, which was the material selected as lightweight, durable, um, and sustainably made, um, would hang when it's not in use by the students. Um, then they would be able to reach up and pull the board off the pegs, pulling it up towards them, and move a set of retractable legs as shown. And then it could be rested on the desk and the legs could be hooked over the plexiglass guard to function something similar to a music stand to provide kind of that natural angle if they're sitting down rather than having to go and interact with another set of students or, or another teacher in another classroom. And it could also be placed on top of the desk and be angled to function as an art easel. Yeah, and again, the intention with these special activity boards is that students can choose a configuration that works for them and move objects around depending on their needs. 
So similarly, the desks will be outfitted with small S hooks that can be purchased inexpensively, and this will allow them to customize their individual spaces um, and connect classroom items to their desks. So like bins and folders that are no longer being used inside of the classroom, they can bring to their desks, um, as well as things like their personal belongings and backpacks and potential household items that they might bring in as well. So although students are not actually building their own desks, their, um, the ability for them to arrange and customize their space and have this sense of sort of placemaking um, allows students to take responsibility for their spaces and build good habits like cleaning their desks um, that will carry over with them for the years to come. And then a small little detail that as funny as it may seem upon first glance is we um, recommended that students bring in a five gallon bucket to be placed underneath their chair. So in an ideal world, um, the school would be able to provide stools that could be pulled out, but understanding that both with time and budgetary constraints, we decided to rework this um, concept with what students would either most likely already have at home or could be easily purchased. So the theory of this is it would be a simple addition that would allow each student to have a lightweight and portable option um, that could act as a seat or they could sit on the ground and it could be a workspace for them if they're working outdoors or another some sort of flexible area outside of the classroom. As we know, um, many schools are exploring options of what the cafeteria and the gym would look like with social distancing measures. We thought this could be a good way um, to mediate that, allow them to get outside, but still maintain their own personal space. No one has to worry about touching it. They can tell them where to go. It can be directed, just kind of a, a simple little solution that would help solve a few problems. So again, our emphasis on this customization also relies on the idea of sustainability. So students may be asked to bring leftover items from their houses, like literally this five gallon bucket or yogurt containers or leftover cans, um, and combine them with the objects in their classroom to kind of create their own desk space. So this not only fosters a sustainable mindset by asking them to sort of reimagine used items, but it further develops um, this idea of safety. Um, so we not only want them to feel safe from COVID and certain like health restrictions, but to really allow them to create their own spaces and have this feeling of safety and comfort within a school environment. Um, yeah, so we hope that our ideas may be helpful to you going forward and that they are practical and hopefully something that may be able to be implemented um, based on your schools and your individual needs. Um, but we would love to hear your feedback. Hey. Nice job, guys. Um, this is Jack Bialowski. I think uh, this super considerations, the only uh, constructive comment I would have is that the particle board, while it's sustainable, is not something that's easily sanitized and that you might want to consider a surface that is uh, more plasticized, less permeable. Um, but otherwise, I think you guys have done a super job. Yeah, I, I would agree. This is Ruth. Um, I, I think that the, the sort of creativity that you've shown in using everyday objects and allowing kids to be creative with them is really very cool. Um, the idea of kids being creative with their own environments is really important. I think that you've really done a great job. Low cost, ordinary stuff, great found object, use of found objects. Like it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I, this is Tim Hawk. Um, I, I wanted to share, I think that this is um, something that actually could be used next week uh, yeah. in schools to help students um, gain and uh, feel a sense of safety. And, you know, a lot of the issues that we're dealing right now are psychological. Um, so this will help people to participate in a process of easily uh, impacting their fear. And I think that architects play a large role in creating um, comfort. And I think you are onto it. And I am absolutely impressed that you are probably, uh, I don't mean to be ageist, but it's sort of like American Idol. You're like 19 year old people um, that are doing this. And I think that's amazing. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Tim.
that's true. It's stuff. It, it, all these ideas are things that could be easily executed by uh, ordinary people in a classroom. Got a couple more minutes for comments. If anyone else has anything they'd like to uh, respond to these two young ladies. Yeah, this is Bruce. I, I in particular really like the way you've taken into consideration the movement of the students where they don't have to go from classroom to classroom and how it can be switched from one function to the next. I think oftentimes that is missed and you know, uh, disinfecting a space or, or trying to move students uh, around a, a school is, is something that's going to be a lot harder for everyone to do going forward. And I think you, you've really hit that, uh, uh, that well. You've, you've addressed that issue uh, really, really nice with the response. Yeah, I think too, um, the concept of focusing on individuals' environment, I think is really, is really key. I think that's a great idea. Even moving forward, right, culturally, a big part of what might come out of all this is how the how the cultural shift might happen. So you could see moving forward where there might be is more of an emphasis on allowing students of all ages to take more ownership of their space. And that may impact furniture, it may impact layout. You know, oftentimes students go to school and then they leave and they don't necessarily maybe see it that way. So I think starting to build that uh, idea of, hey, this is a way you can start to take ownership, feel safe, um, is really cool. So I think that's, I think it's a great idea. Thank you. I, I like the, uh, I really like the bucket idea. I mean, use them in uh, scouting all the time as tools and there's something that's easy, easily personalized. That'd be like the, you know, the first day of school back is to personalize your bucket. Something simple, but who doesn't have a five gallon bucket? You know, like it's, they're just everywhere. <laughs> All right, guys, uh, to keep us on schedule, we'll move to the next one here, I think. Um, so Ashley Kerwood, I think I see you in the audience here. Um, we'll let you go ahead and share your screen and, and get us started here. Hello, yes, I'm Ashley Kerwood and I worked with a couple of other people from my office on this project, Michael Bednar, Lauren Miller, and Paige Smaling and Erin Akili. And Michael actually has a presentation, so I'll let you screen share, Michael. Yep. Uh, so we'll share here. Um, so can everybody see my screen okay? Good. Okay, uh, so when we started talking about all of this, we realized pretty quickly um, how many issues a school district will face um, and how it starts to get uh, a really big problem that they face. Um, and these school districts are very different in the way that they like they have different challenges, they have different situations. Um, and even within those school districts, there are different challenges on a student by student basis in terms of what they may or may not have access to. And because of the issues we're facing now, um, those, that difference in access is amplified. Um, and then on top of that, school districts don't always have the funds to be able to make some changes to handle the situation. So. After all these discussions, we kind of came to three major goals that guided the way that we thought about this. Um, so those goals would be to provide a flexible framework for all school districts that could be adapted to all the situations that they may be in, um, to provide equitable access to every student in any situation, regardless of their background or the resources they have access to. And we really wanted to make sure to try and utilize the existing assets that a school district and a community has to their full potential. So we started looking at that by taking a step way back and starting to look at what the differences are in the age groups and levels that students are in. So when students are younger, uh, they need more of an emphasis on communal spaces and um, have a teacher to interact with and things like that. And as they get older, um, they begin to become more independent and have the ability to deal with and grow in different types of learning environments. Um, and that was a spectrum that we tried to keep in mind as we worked through that. Um, in addition to that spectrum, you've got the spectrum that the uh, different subjects sit along. So on one end, you've got uh, subjects that have more physical components or require more physical environments, such as science, music, PE, art, things like that. Um, and then on the other end, you've got subjects like history, language, arts, and math 
that could more easily occur in many different types of learning spaces um, and are more easily distributed virtually. Um, so with all of that in mind, we came back to this issue of social distancing and how a school is a place where a lot of people interact on a regular basis and they're switching classes and spaces and coming into contact not only with other people, but environments that would need to be cleaned on a regular basis and things like that. Um, and so we wanted to find out how to minimize that daily contact that students have with each other and also the environment they're, that they're in. And what we eventually settled on um, was moving away from a multi-classroom schedule uh, towards a single classroom cohort. And so that would be a shift from students going from class to class and space to space with different people to having a period of time where they're with a smaller group of maybe 10 to 16 other students and a teacher, and they go to that space every day. So we wanted to have it so that you could still do learning and get education from home, but we thought it was important to still have that physical space for students to come to and learn from and interact with. Um, so there are benefits to that, uh, such as uh, reducing bullying because students get to know each other better, um, having more individualized learning, a better relationship with their teacher maybe. Um, but on the other side of that, the, the negatives are that it, you might have a less diverse experience. So you're interacting with less people um, and you're also in a more limited space at some time. So we wanted to see how we could use this cohort idea, but still provide a diverse experience for the students. Um, so to do that, we took a look at the whole school year and thought about, uh, okay, if we want to provide these cohorts a more diverse experience, um, maybe students don't need to necessarily stay in the same cohort for the entire school year. So looking here at this, you can see that we looked at the entire calendar year um, and distributed that schedule more evenly between the year and provide the students with five two-month period, or yeah, five two-month periods of being in a cohort. So they would start in one and after two months move to another. And in that situation, they're in a different learning environment with a different group of students. Um, and in between each one of those two month periods, you've got a two week amount of time where that quarantine could occur, um, where that, that situation could be uh, mitigated of having students come in contact with each other and spread, uh, potentially spread things. Um, so this becomes a real opportunity to also give these students a chance to dive deeper into subject matter. Um, but because of this, we're looking at more space that's needed. We now have smaller groups of students and we have the same assets in the same community, um, but we need more space for that learning to happen. So we started looking at how this might occur. Um, so a typical community and school district has a certain set of real estate and different assets that are available to them, um, depending on where they are. Uh, and keeping in mind that idea of uh, the younger kids needing more of a consistent space and more of a physical space and those older kids being more independent, um, you can see here at the bottom, we started looking at how those younger kids would start filling up those existing school buildings, those high schools, middle schools, elementary schools, and fill in those classroom spaces that exist already. Um, and then as they get a little bit older and they have the opportunity to move into other spaces throughout the community, you have alternative learning spaces that middle school kids and especially those high school kids would be able to go to um, and learn from. And with all of these assets that exist in a community, we can provide that space between those cohorts. But the problem that comes from all of that is that we now have to figure out how to transport all of these kids uh, to more spaces than just a few school buildings like typical. Um, and so uh, with that in mind, real quick jumping back into uh, those alternative learning environments, you have some of those alternative learning environments in the school buildings themselves. So um, I think the last presentation mentioned how like you've got these cafeterias, auditoriums, gymnasiums that aren't going to be used uh, as their traditional purpose 
in this new situation. So you could put pop-up classrooms in there. Um, those could be oriented more towards those older kids who uh, don't necessarily need a more traditional classroom space. Um, and these pop-ups could be more conducive to their learning style. Outside of that actual school building, um, you're looking at the community at large. And so every community has this stock of existing real estate that can um, potentially be used for some of these cohort groups of students. Um, and these buildings aren't always used during a typical school day or during those hours. So we were looking at uh, between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. as sort of a typical idea of when school might happen. Um, and during that time, publicly oriented places like a city hall or a public library, they don't really get heavy use in all of their spaces that they have. Um, on you've got private businesses like event spaces that typically host weddings um, or banquets and also movie theaters um, where their clientele is more focused in the afternoons and weekends and evenings. Um, and so we were looking at potentially allowing these students or to have their cohort classrooms in some of these spaces um, and provide some sort of incentive, whether it's a, a tax incentive or something to these private businesses and allow these students to spread out throughout the community. Um, so back to that transportation issue that we're facing now. Uh, so the existing asset of school buses that a school district has right now, traditionally they would be able to hold between 66 and 90 students. But with social distancing, we lower that number down to 16 to 22. Um, and so that provides us with an opportunity to use other parts of that transportation system to facilitate this spread out learning situation. Um, so to do that, we looked at that schedule that a bus may follow throughout the day. Uh, so this right here is a look at maybe how the grades might be distributed without the day. So you see it between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. Um, we spread out that schedule a little bit more because we're gonna need more time for transportation and more time for cleaning along with that transportation. Um, now this doesn't mean that these school days necessarily need to be divided by grade. Um, we could also have a system where those cohorts are divided uh, between those different schedules throughout the day. Um, but then when you start to overlay this idea of different start and end times for all the different grades and cohorts, um, you see there's an opportunity for this bus to be used for something other than transportation. Um, and that would be delivering some of those specialized subjects that require more physical components or physical environments like those science classes and music and PE. Um, and then at the end of the day, once the bus has gone through its two periods of transportation and it's, uh, gone, it's done for the day, you have an opportunity to provide resources to students who don't necessarily get access to them after hours to complete their homework or other assignments. So we could provide um, free Wi-Fi and library study hall resources to those students once the bus is finished for the day. Um, but jumping into how the thing we wanted to focus on was how we could better utilize this time where the bus is not necessarily being used for transportation. Um, so we looked at the schedule uh, that a student may follow. Um, and because we're spreading out over the course of two month periods with different cohorts, and we have that opportunity to really dive deeper into ideas, um, we thought that we could also reduce the number of subjects that were covered in each period of two months or so. And so you can see at that, that daily schedule at the bottom, that we have one cohort room where those students go to that cohort room every day. And instead of having a traditional eight, eight periods, they would have um, three or four, and they could really dive into those subjects for a longer period of time each day. And then by the end of two months, they potentially have gotten deeper into a subject than if they would follow a traditional schedule of just going 30 to 45 minutes on a subject every single day. Um, the other thing that we looked at, if you look at that calendar on the bottom, uh, is that in the mornings, you have those subjects that could more easily be distributed virtually. So if those students are 
learning from home or something like that. Um, in the afternoons, you now can provide those specialized subjects via this bus system that we, we looked at. Um, so with this bus system, you've got this issue of how we need to divide up the space. So students now need a, uh, a distance of six feet between other students and we're using less of the bus. We now have that 16 to 22 students instead of 90 or so. Um, and that gives us more space to provide something else in that place. Um, and so with that in mind, we came up with two different types of retrofitting of these school buses to use them to distribute that learning throughout the community. Um, the first would be uh, we just overlay that, that social distancing space between students and in those free spaces between them, we have actual storage and a delivery method to deliver some of those specialized physical components to where the students are. So if the students are at a cohort classroom location, this bus after it's finished transporting students to where they are supposed to be for the day, can also transport those subjects to where the students are. So you can, you can transport um, musical instruments or uh, beakers for science exper experiments. Um, and on top of that, you could also use this as a way to distribute lunch throughout the community to students who rely on the school for their lunch needs. Um, and so this bus is able to serve multiple purposes more than just transportation by taking advantage of the fact that we have lower student capacity now. Um, the other sort of retrofitting we looked at would be, would have less responsibility uh, to transport students and be more focused on bringing physical spaces to where those students are again. So again, that can be where their cohort classroom is, that could be a public park, that could be somewhere in the community where these students can come to the bus or they can learn from the bus itself. Um, and so we took a swing at looking at how this bus may easily be modified. Um, so you can start to see that we have fold down desks. We've got uh, some trans or some storage for um, different seating elements um, for study material and books. Um, we looked at ideas of putting like writable surfaces. So this bus could actually serve as a very flexible space for a cohort um, for any sort of subject. Um, and then that bus further could modify to provide outdoor learning in addition to those things on side the bus. So we looked at how the bus could open up um, and could serve different purposes like um, providing a performance stage for theater uh, or carrying different physical education items, uh, doing performances, things like that. Um, and then it can really transform from this one purpose asset to something that can serve many different purposes in many different locations throughout the community. And so through this retrofitting of our school buses, um, we can start to use our community real estate, our existing school buildings, and these school buses to distribute the learning throughout the entire community to every student in any situation. Um, and we really think that this can be a really flexible idea that can fit to whatever a school district has available to them and can fit the needs of any, uh, any student. So thank you. All right. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, we've got a few minutes for some questions here. We're running a little behind schedule, but I uh, want to open up some, for some feedback. May I pitch in? This is Salim Awazani, uh, BGSU. Uh, I'm professor here and BGSU. Uh, Mike and the group, uh, I would like to say uh, this is actually a, a strategic way of thinking about solving uh, the problem we are in here. Uh, I couldn't help comparing what you were talking about with what uh, actually group number one, Julia and Molly were talking about. Both are great in different ways uh, uh, and the comparison will make my point. The first group is in, in a way that they use simple mechanisms, simple uh, actually material and they really definitely uh, uh, very efficient from that point of view, as I believe uh, uh, 
maybe uh, somebody mentioned the fact that this could be working even next week. In your case, this will not be working next week. You know that for obvious reasons. Not to put it down, on the contrary, it is great. Uh, actually, I just want to pinpoint a, a few points here. I wrote them down. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I like the fact that uh, you have a comprehensive looking at the problem and uh, taking into consideration something like the following, the discipline requirements. You mentioned history versus science and so on. I like very much the fact that you looked into the age requirements. Uh, number three, uh, you talked about the idea of fixed space versus the students go from a place to a place and so on. Uh, then you moved on and mentioned something about even you delve into the fact that uh, you may have five periods in the year, two months and so on. This is a very comprehensive way of thinking. Uh, then in, in the, even you look down into going into the community and using these spaces. I don't want to even talk about transportation because it's great by itself. Uh, I, I, I want to be a bit focused on my what I'm saying. Now, uh, I was wondering, within this uh, like limited frame of time that you and your group have, with this extensive kind of research and ideas, uh, uh, I, I, I trust you have good ideas. I know you have wisdom, uh, like all of us. But tell me. What else you have done in order to bring these out? Did you do research? Did you talk to some people? Did you talk to uh, a principal in the in the in the in the school? Did you talk to the community groups on this? This is where I, I'm trying to to hit here. Uh, so uh, because it wasn't a ton of time, um, we kind of some of our group members have relationships with uh, teachers um, and we got some a little bit of feedback from them. Um, but we also relied a lot on uh, like our own experience uh, and what we how we learned when we were younger um, and what we remembered and uh, that kind of helped us look at this and we thought because it was such a big idea we could um, we could rely on those sort of things to kind of guide us. So I don't know if anyone else in the group has anything. What? What's important about this um, relative to the last scheme, which is immediately uh, achievable and relates to small scale ideas, this is thinking on a macro level and the value of it on an immediate basis is to cause school administrators to think about how, wh whether they use the school bus or any of these individual notions, the notion of thinking operationally about how they can change uh, their delivery method of teaching. That's, that's the value of this scheme to me more than anything else. And I think it's very valuable in that regard. Um. Yeah, it, it, you're pointing to, to uh, a multitude of um, possibilities that um, can be manipulated to uh, um, you know, expand, you know, space and um, ways to, to deal with this problem. Um, not, not just about buildings, but about scheduling and about use of building types and spaces and even the buses. So yeah, I think Jack's right. It, it's uh, opening up the possibilities of thinking of ways to solve problems. I like the thing that's really interesting is the idea of public-private partnerships. And someone in the chat pointed out that <clears throat> utilizing outside buildings to spread students out and using movie theaters and things that are largely unused is probably a great idea. And I think that's really something that districts could look at to provide um, partnership with their communities. Yeah, nice job. Thank you guys. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Yeah, we we're really excited being able to look at this opportunity and take into more into account than just the COVID situation. The ideas of equal access, especially everything that's going on in the world today and thinking about a better solution that we can address this since it is such a dynamic period of change. The, uh, I think most, most of us may underestimate how many students uh, in urban areas or even rural areas um, 
rely on school lunch programs and uh, breakfast. Uh, so I think utilizing the assets to uh, as a distribution system was uh, pretty good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, appreciate it, guys. And we'll have some time, hopefully, at the end for some some final thoughts too. That maybe um, in retrospect, all these different presentations will bring some bigger ideas uh, to light. So, uh, with that, the next presenter will be me. So. Um, I, I promise it wasn't a rig system, but the, the fellows that did the jurying um, chose my ideas to move forward. So I'll try to go quickly through them uh, so we allow for plenty of time um, at the end for some more questions. So I'm gonna share my screen here. <clears throat> All right. Let's see what we got. All right, so um, my presentation starts with a few caveats. Um, and that, that being that um, mine is focused on surfaces and, and surface transmission. So uh, those of you that weren't in the midterm review, I acknowledge the fact that surface transmission has come out as uh, maybe not being as big of a threat as initially had been thought. But um, I investigated the idea and, and I think it's still, there's still some worthwhile uh, thoughts here. So surfaces in general, um, you know, architecture, that's kind of our medium we work with. We define spaces uh, with surfaces, right? Whether it be glass, brick, floors, ceilings, et cetera. That's, that's how we work. Um, surfaces can be used to express all sorts of ideas, depth, texture, pattern, light, shadow, acoustic properties, all sorts of things um, are, are affected by surfaces. Unfortunately, those surfaces can have germs. And uh, thinking about, you know, uh, K through 12 schools, is essentially, you know, kids are, are interfacing with these surfaces throughout the day uh, in many different ways. Uh, and then they touch their faces, right? And that's, that's kind of the problem. Um, so I tried to take a lens uh, of looking at just a very narrow bandwidth of, of the problem and try to develop some strategies that, that are easily deployable, are affordable, and, and also preserve the quality of space without making too many sacrifices um, spatially with, with the architecture itself. So uh, three strategies I, I kind of focused on would be antimicrobial surfaces, automated cleaning of surfaces, and then strategies to avoid contact with surface altogether. So the first idea, antimicrobial surfaces. So doing a little research, um, found that you know there's a variety of different conditions that allow for viruses or bacteria to, to be harbored on a surface. Um, copper uh, comes out as, as being one of them that, that does not uh, allow for viruses to be um, a threat on them for very long. And this comes out um, I think I'm skipping in here. Here we go. Sorry. So um, the reason copper um, is unique in this way is it, it won't go into a whole chemistry lesson here, but there's a, a, a free electron in its outer orbit that, that allows for it to, to bind with other molecules um, in an easy way. So in, in essence, surfaces of copper have lots of ions on them. Um, the ions then um, are admitted by the microbes, so whether it's a virus or a bacteria, the cell walls of them easily admit the, uh, the copper ions into the surface of it. Won't get into the whole lesson, but it, essentially at the end of it, it, it destroys the DNA of the virus um, and making it less harmful. And going back to the previous slide, that can happen in up to uh, about four hours. So I guess then the solution is just uh, to make everything copper, right? But uh, obviously this isn't a practical solution, but I thought this was a funny image that, that maybe shows an extreme, but maybe there is a way that we can use copper and copper alloys in a, in a way uh, in high touch surfaces, hand, you know, doorknobs, uh, levers for sinks, et cetera. Um, and I did want to kind of put this out as, as you know, I'm, I'm basically just collecting information and, and putting it in the hands of those that maybe can use this. Uh, so one of the leaders in, in, in metal alloys is uh, the Zaner company. They do a lot of uh, custom work. If you've probably seen some of their buildings uh, throughout the world, but they're leading the charge in this, this research about copper and its ability to, to function as an antimicrobial surface. So they have a whole uh, white paper that they've developed. Uh, it's, it's sort of a monograph actually of their work and it's free to download. Uh, there's some links at the back of my presentation that I'll, I'll leave up for a moment. So if you're interested in this idea, uh, there's more resources out there. And uh, one of the things that Zaner's really good at is, is making copper beautiful. So again, not sacrificing uh, the aesthetic quality of spaces. In fact, maybe improving them in some ways, but uh, perhaps copper is a solution for us. 
My second thought here is uh, ways of cleaning surfaces uh, in a more efficient manner. So UV light uh, is another, um, it works in, actually in a similar way that, that copper does, but it, it uses actually light spectrum to destroy the DNA of, of a microbe. So UV light has a, a, a series of spectrums on it, but UVC light particularly is, is damaging to cells, including, including humans. Um, the ozone layer is very good at filtering that out, but we can create UVC light. And in fact, that's how we filter our water. That's how we do a number of um, kind of industrial processes uh, that, that require sanitization. So um, there's a number of companies that are, that are deploying this technology already. So uh, Dimer has this, this um, product called the Germ Falcon, which is uh, used to, to clean airplanes. Um, so it's sort of a you know, it's like the, the stewardess cart that they push down, but it has these kind of wings that are used to sanitize um, the seats in between flights. So perhaps, you know, a similar approach could be used to sanitize classrooms or hallways or desks uh, between classes. Restrooms also um, are, are another issue, obviously. So uh, Boeing, nice little pun here for us. So Boeing has piloted this idea of, of self-cleaning restrooms uh, using UV light. So in between use, uh, there's a portion of time that could be used where UV light could be uh, spread throughout the space to, to help sanitize. So again, perhaps maybe this is something we could deploy in a commercial setting or in schools um, to help with restroom cleanliness. Um, so obviously cleaning is, is, is laborsome and um, maybe we don't have the capacity to, to hire staff to do this cleaning, but, but maybe robots are helpful for us. So Everyone's probably familiar with, with the Roomba, right? This is a handy little thing that can be helpful in uh, cleaning up our floors. They've got ones now that, that have UV light built into them that can be used uh, more on a residential scale, but perhaps this can be scaled up. Uh, they're used for cleaning furniture, floors, et cetera. There's also um, already in use a more industrial size, uh, kind of a larger uh, concept here, but uh, following the same Roomba concept where it has sort of a, a learning program where it can map out spaces, but these are used in hospitals already that have UV light and um, they actually can, can grow vertically, they can get on shelves, um, and they, they, be, they sort of learn their environment as they go. And uh, these actually are available for, for trial. I signed up for a, a free demo, I haven't heard back from them yet, but I'm kind of curious to see how available these are, if it's something that can be purchased or rented, or maybe there's a service that, that can be hired to do uh, this sort of work. Taking this idea another step further, there's also a company that's looking at drones. So similar to a Roomba idea, but in this case, it actually flies. So um, again, they can be mapped out. They can, they can learn paths and, and surfaces uh, throughout the building. And maybe there's, there's an opportunity here for drones to be used uh, in between classes for hallway sanitization or in the classrooms themselves uh, between classes. So another concept here that's kind of thought provoking. Um, there's also this, so the vertical surfaces uh, throughout the, the building, lockers, uh, walls that may or may not be, you know, glazed tile or something. There are uh, window cleaning robots that can be used to clean the exterior of skyscrapers currently. Uh, they're not using, using UV light uh, as of yet, but I would assume that that would be something that could be uh, deployed in the future as an idea. Um, a third concept, and this is, this is a little bit more low tech for the most part, but you know, just avoiding contact with surfaces in general. So uh, a very low tech solution here is something called the sanitary key or the clean key. There's a number of products out there on the market that are already um, kind of pushing this, but made out of copper. Um, as we learned before, it's, it's good at killing germs, but it's a, it's a way to open and close doors or sign keypads or call elevators without your hands uh, being involved in that, that touching. So uh, a very low tech cost-effective way that maybe could be used uh, arming students with these these tools. Um, this is not new technology, but but maybe there's there's ways to implement more automated doors uh, in in high traffic areas uh, where you can wave or or even a proximity reader could be used to open doors um, for those that are, have permission granted to them. And then taking that a step further, integrating you know cell phone technology. There's ways of unlocking and locking doors that don't require keys or don't require touching of the physical surfaces. This is another very low tech uh, solution to, to opening doors. And this would mostly work you know, where there's not a latch, but uh, you, know, you wash your hands in the restroom and then you go to leave the restroom space and then you have to touch the door handle. So this is a way to um, 
you know, open doors, operate, operate doors without actually touching the handles with your hands themselves. And then in a similar way, uh, kind of a foot operated solution as well. This is a, a concept. I don't believe it's an actual product yet, but this one actually is a door latch. So for doors that would need to be secured, there's a way that a foot pedal could be used to operate the doors. And I'm sure there's a number of ADA concerns that come along with this, but uh, pretty thought provoking ideas um, that can be utilized um, to operate door hardware without actually using your hands. Uh, and they're kind of showing it here used in toilet partitions so that you know you wouldn't have to interface with the toilet partition itself. So again, um, just throwing out some ideas. I don't uh, have kids and I don't work on school projects often, but I think some of these concepts maybe could be um, useful, thought provoking if nothing else, and then hopefully readily but deployable into school environments um, in a quick and timely fashion. So. I have these references here uh, for anyone that's maybe interested in some of the things I brought up, uh, and I welcome your questions. Where do we get one of those uh, copper restrooms that you showed? That was beautiful. <laughs> um, I think Trump maybe has some gold ones. You can maybe talk to him and see who's, <laughs> who's doing his work. I don't know, I think it's kind of a joke, but yeah. No, it's not a joke. I actually think that there's some um, those point to the idea of durability and beauty and how the science actually, um, you know, a lot of the more beautiful, durable materials or a lot of the more durable materials are actually beautiful. Um, so I think there's some real point to the fact that we, if we budgeted projects better, we could use more durable materials, which would actually in increase the safety of our schools. Copper is a product in uh, anti-fouling paint. I think its properties as an antimicrobial are, are uh, well known. And uh, it's, these are very useful ideas, Eric. Thank you. Eric, I was gonna suggest, uh, do you have any thought to uh, how uh, some of the germs come from outside to inside? And maybe, uh, I, th I think sometimes there's some low-tech things like, uh, in some countries and in many people's homes, uh, you take your shoes off at the door mm -hmm. and uh, you have a, you wear slippers or something like that. So that you have sort of separate clean from dirty, um, just the way they do in hospitals. We have, you know, clean, you know, just a segregation of uh, clean and dirty. Yeah, that's actually a great point here. Yeah. All right, um, if there's no other comments, we'll move on to our, our fourth group here. Um, I believe it is Stephen Gastright. I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Yep. All right, Stephen, if you're there, go ahead and take it away. All right. Let's see, all right. Hello, everyone. I know I haven't met many of you, and uh, certainly happy to be involved in this and meet you today. Um, uh, I think that um, we uh, have retooled our presentation based on some of the comments we've gotten. And, um, you know, we kind of started out with this idea that um, the pandemic really kind of was a natural disaster for our schools. And so, uh, originally, we had looked at uh, everything very quantitatively, like how do we get kids back in school safely as being the main priority. But we do think some of the superintendents uh, we talked to and some of the thought leaders we talked to really kind of questioned whether or not there is a decision uh, in this brief period we have before we have to start kind of committing to action of um, whether the normal was really the goal and whether we should kind of be more creative and rethink how to rebuild education during this, this period and make, make the mitigations we have in the meantime actually constructive and part of the future. So I loved seeing the magic school bus uh, and really um, appreciated the kind of creativity that I think could be tapped into to solve this problem. I would say that we, through our investigations, 
had a very practical bent as to, you know, many of us have, you know, dealt with a lot of kids at home <laughs> during the spring. And so we were really, uh, had a lot of buy-in from our group about how do we, you know, how do we get kids back to face-to-face -face instruction? And, um, but uh, we retooled it instead of looking at the quantity issue, kind of trying to incorporate the quality of issue, the things we know about uh, what makes education successful for kids and how to get there. So what we started with was thinking about um, the, the best way to make sure that the student is at the center of this is really, I think, to decentralize some of the leadership and decision making. So looking at the school, we kind of said, well, what if we split um, the leadership into kind of a, an executive team and then teaching teams um, that can really look at wh what learning uh, and teaching look like in a pandemic uh, affected school environment. And starting with that approach, we really thought that the executive team would be setting the goals and constraints. Um, so every school we talked to, uh, they said, we don't, we don't get any more space, we don't get any more staff, we don't get any more money, so start there, and uh, which, which was uh, a little daunting. Um, but we thought the, the highest priority for everyone was really creating a safe environment. So understanding where, uh, what the guidelines are, producing our own guidelines to educate our, our community, and, and making sure everyone felt safe to come back to school who wanted to come back to school. Uh, and then the second thing was really, again, focusing on learning. If we're gonna go through the effort to get people back, let's make sure it's high quality learning that's happening and not just uh, a, a Band-Aid uh, approach. So, and then, and then just the third thing I wanna talk about here is really, uh, it, it's a very iterative process. So we, we set a goal as daily full-time education for all the kids who wanted it as being an option, but as we look at capacity of schools, we realize that some people are looking at various uh, A, B uh, split schedule options. And then there's actually a really interesting kind of needs-based scheduling, which might prioritize uh, kind of elementary school kids as having much more face time and using other uh, facilities. Um, and then having more independent learners in the higher grades, having less face time uh, and more uh, online learning, blended learning options that we thought were interesting. But we kind of, again, were focusing on the daily full-time education for all who wanted it. Um, the next thing we thought the executive team had to really do is understand the building that they're in and categorize their space. And it kind of fell into actually three categories. The two obvious ones were grade level classrooms, um, which, were fairly obvious in all the plans we looked at. We thought all the common spaces could be used then for, because in the grade level classrooms, you, you're typically going to a less dense uh, student to teacher ratio, uh, that the, the larger open spaces then would be used for a higher um, density. So more students per teacher and could be used uh, inventively for the teachers teaching enrichment classes, so art, music, PE, et cetera, to figure out other uh, ways of accommodating those students in those larger quantities. Um, and then we really thought the executive team then had to design the teaching team. So who are the people at each grade level who will be working together to, to optimize uh, the learning environment? And then who are, who's part of the enrichment team that has to optimize how we provide those other uh, kind of learning opportunities. So moving to the teaching teams, there we really wanted to start with learning. And that's where we looked at, um, you know, uh, the list of learning modalities. Um, we thought that each grade level team would have to really um, pick two or three learning modes that they want to optimize their classrooms for. Each of those modes can be diagrammed and those diagrams then can be tested in spaces so this is, for instance, maybe a classroom with small group learning happening. And then when we try to socially distance that, we find we go from 24 kids to 12 kids pretty quickly. So once you know uh, in your grade level what your classroom capacity is, you can then start designing your learning teams. So these are uh, teams of kids that would stick together, so co cohorts of sort. 
Um, and then those, those teams um, would stay together through the course of the day as a group. Uh, and really the learning environment would be optimized to accommodate those teams. And we really think that idea of team building is something that could strengthen the resilience of the students. So uh, we think that you know, kids typically um, learn a lot about teamwork and uh, a lot of the things we're talking about today was just the sacrifices we have to go through to make sure we're keeping everyone healthy. I think that the teamwork model uh, reinforces that. But also it's a visual way because um, you can imagine with all the kids running around the, the school building, uh, it's a visual way for the teachers to understand if order, if the order that is there for the safety of students is being kept. They see a, an orange shirt and with the green shirts, they can easily intervene and try to um, keep, keep everybody in a safe, uh, socially distanced um, organization. So uh, a similar thing happens with the enrichment uh, teams. So these are, uh, you know, they have much different learning modes they would be exploring in the spaces they've got access to, but it's really about how do we do large group um, activities for either PE in those spaces, what can we do, art, music, et cetera. And then, um, I think they have to determine what the capacity of those shared spaces could be. Uh, and then similarly, their enrichment teams would then be kind of a blending of the various learning teams um, to come up with groups that stick together. Here's uh, Team Picasso and Team Mozart um, possibly reinforcing some of the um, curricular items. But um, all of that information, well, then another aspect we are looking at is just, you know, uh, building a school community has to do with the sharing of experiences and events. And that was certainly something we felt was threatened under the, uh, the conditions of the pandemic. So uh, some of the ideas we had about how events could be accommodated were certainly in those shoulder months, taking advantage of the outdoors and how do we do the things we were doing inside, outside uh, in a way that's safe. But we also think there's been some great uh, investigations into kind of online performance, um, uh, a, a continual thing with the schools where my kids go is just trying to get the community connected. And so the online kind of gives us an avenue to figure out who's engaged and how to connect with them. And then certainly even into the winter, we can use our, um, our kind of assembly spaces in a distanced way and just increase the amount of uh, performances um, which would be good for practice, right? So we, we asked them to practice anyway, so we, we think that would be reasonable. So once all the uh, leadership teams have gotten their um, information together about the student capacity, the, I, that can be then fed back to the executive team for the real artwork of the whole effort, which is designing the master schedule. Um, we had t done a scenario looking at a, a grade that be that turned into six learning teams and over a seven block schedule. Uh, it actually worked out pretty well. Um, we were asked some questions about just uh, tutorial or intervention time as well as uh, before and after care. And I think if you start to lo look at the master schedule by student, you find out that by adding uh, shorter blocks before and after the school, you can uh, potentially accommodate all the feeding um, and uh, so breakfast, lunch, and dinner that's done at a lot of uh, schools, as well as take advantage of those times for tutorial. Um, and then uh, certainly, you know, we mentioned the classroom size spaces and large spaces, what they'd be used for. Any smaller space then could be used as a tutorial space during the day uh, for interventions for students. Um, and so uh, the second part of the art is designing the master calendar. So another thing we heard from um, actually uh, some of the experiences at schools in Germany that have been reopened now for a few months, some of the things they've said is that, you know, the information about uh, what we should be doing is always changing and it gets very cumbersome to like on a daily basis be trying to figure out how it affects you. So setting intervals um, that your school will be operating in certain modes and then saying, hey, we're gonna uh, reassess at these times allows the teachers to be much more focused about um, what they need to do. Um, 
Also, I think designing the master calendar can help you accommodate the, the potential closures that we're all anticipating, uh, how to do that, as well as um, uh, kind of giving everybody uh, uh, a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of just uh, what, what are the goals for uh, learning, especially if you're in an A, B mode, uh, when will you be in, when will you not be in, et cetera. Uh, and again, it's not just the adults that have a role in this. We think that the students uh, can play a much bigger role um, and we can make hygiene teachable to them. So the trend, we came up with this idea about mask up, wash up, clean up. This idea that during the transition time, students uh, will probably uh, be told to wear a mask during transitions. But we think that's also a time for to use portable, increased uh, frequency of sinks, so maybe portable sinks in the hallways that uh, we can uh, have them wash up. And then, uh, you know, when we talk about sanitizing the learning space, actually having that be something that's done at each transition as they come in, that the kids are in charge of making sure their own spaces are um, ready for learning. So anyway, that's uh, our thoughts on the matter. And um, I'd love to uh, open it up and hear if anybody has any questions or comments. If I may, uh, yes, thank you very much, Steve. This is very interesting kind of uh, presentation. Uh, the theme which I notice in your presentation is the word uh, team. I notice that is all over the place. Uh, from your uh, perspective, of course, this idea means the team has to work first and the different teams have to work also together. What do you think this, the, the, if, if the success uh, in other words, the two sides I talked about, the team is working and the different teams working together, it seems is going to lead us to success of your scheme. Where do you think that uh, the problem could be more? Is within a single team collaboration or with, with the one team to the other? Uh, well, in our, well, in my opinion, I think that um, the reason the teamwork is important is, um, you know, I think the solutions are going to be bottom up. And so um, it, as much as um, we want to have all the successes and the growth that we were seeing before the pandemic, I think that the successes now are going to be based on the buy-in from the bottom up of everyone involved. And so it really starts, that's why, you know, I think getting the teaching teams in place so that teachers are, are and their understanding of their students are at the core of the solutions um, makes the experiences in the classroom effective. And really the success for the students is going to be based, if we're trying to get them back in the classroom face to face, it's going to be um, based on the, the buy-in at that classroom level. So. I think that was our initial goal was how can we get the teachers empowered to figure out how to get the teaching done and then that has to blend really well because um, you know there was approach we looked at early on where uh, students would stay in one classroom and basically the teachers would move around the students but we really think that um, you know, to make sure that it is student centered, you have to somehow accommodate the teacher and the teaching team's uh, needs because they're the ones who need the resources <laughs> for their students and need to, to be the place where the teaching and learning happens. So I don't know if that answers your question, Salim, but. Yeah, uh, if I may, I don't want to take the whole floor yeah. here. Uh, I think, can I put it in a different way? Sure. Uh, do you think that we are now position better to collaborate in teams because of the danger we are in than the normal times is that a factor in your mind in proposing this 
I, I would hope so. Um, I, I mean, it's a good question. I, I feel like uh, the way things were arranged, we wanted everyone working in teams all along. I do think that this disruption has elevated the question of, um, you know, is the classroom an island anymore? Um, or is it part of a, a uh, ecosystem of learning where this, the success in your classroom depends on the success in everyone else's classroom simultaneously. I think that's always been the goal with schools, but I think this disruption has uh, created the need for everyone to start talking to each other about what's going on a little bit more. So I hope, I hope it does lead to more teamwork. Thank you. All right, any other questions for uh, Steve? <clears throat> okay, our last group is um, Alexandra Bowler and Aaron Cook. So if you guys are prepared, we'll get you started. Good afternoon. Um, Aaron's pulling up the image. I'm Alex Bowler. I'm here in AA Dayton, and I work at Hatch Architects. Aaron, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Aaron Cook. I'm a rising senior at The Ohio State University Knowlton School. Um, so we um, were combined as partners because we both have sort of a small scale affordable built solution ideas that um, it's incorporated all here in this rendering. So I'm going to focus in on the blue um, welcoming modules that you can see there in front of the school and then Aaron's going to take it over to talk about the parasol and faux tree outdoor classroom um, ideas. So for the welcoming module. Um, Part of our big goal was to something that could be built fairly quickly and affordably that could be useful for this whole coming back to school thing that everyone's been talking about here. So this is very simple, two by four construction, keeping the four foot by eight foot plywood module as the sizing for this module. But basically this is what a student would enter as they're coming into the school um, for their temperature check and hand sanitizer. But as you'll see in a minute, it's gonna be dressed up to be a little bit more of a fun experience instead of a stressful experience, because this can be a giant change, even for teenagers and little kids that are now have to do all these things when they come into a school. Um, so here's a sample of what an elementary school model can look like. Um, so you can see this one has an underwater coral reef theme. So, um, and then on the right-hand side, you can see some images of animals leading up those are spaced six feet away, um, and they would be animals, in this case, from the coral reef. So there's a little bit of a learning experience for the kids, and they can see what animals live in a coral reef. Um, so this is a view from the top where you can see the six foot parts. And then this is sort of a fold out of what the graphics could be inside. So when they enter this box, they feel like they're in the coral reef. There can be potentially fish hanging above them. There's um, the sort of floor below, they can looking up, they're underwater, they can see out the sky. So you can see how this can evolve to a lot of different types of themes. Um, also music can be playing inside. That's a fair, people can just use their phones and play music underwater theme, or maybe the students choose the music and each day it changes. So here's a variety of elementary school themes. Obviously the ideas are endless here, <laughs> um, but there's a few. And then there's also a version that's a little bit for our older students, middle and high school. Um, so the example here is a school spirit sort of theme. Obviously this would be for the Tigers. Um, so this shows two of those modules put together. So it gets a little bit longer. You still have a slot for temperature checks for someone on the outside that can check the temperature. You still have a hand sanitizer. Um, it's a little bit longer here so that you can put the metal detector as part of the module for those schools that have metal detectors. So a lot of students um, are already used to going through metal detectors in the morning. So this may be less of a um, stressful thing to add on temperature checks, hand sanitizing, but why couldn't it be a little bit more fun to go through the metal detector as well? Um, you can play music as well in here, even some LED lighting. And I think that especially at the older, but even at the younger, it'd be ideal if the students can do um, some of the building and the designing of what the graphics would be on the outside. So maybe this could change every month and another group of students comes up with the graphic 
and maybe or maybe there's multiple modules and different groups of students have painted the different modules so um, the idea here would try to make it student, as much student participation as possible um, and so where these would be placed so these are two schools that I personally am involved with this is um, Stiver School for the Arts in Dayton it has an existing overhang that's their existing entrance where students go in right now their metal detectors are right inside to the left um, but the these modules could be outside but underneath the overhang or they could be inside through a gym um, on the right is a picture where my daughter goes to school and it has a giant rotunda that's already there we can use that space as the entry point and have multiple modules where students can line up and maybe there's one for each staircase and they go to the module that takes them directly up to their staircase to avoid sort of traffic overlap so all of that can be worked out in a variety of situations worst case scenario there's an outdoor space that you have to kind of line things up and there's not a covering and right it could be movable the module could be movable <clears throat> so i think all right i think that brings us up to the parasol concept again like alex said we tried to make our problem solving simple and fast <laughs> following the kiss principle parasols developed to be built quickly out of dimensional lumber that would be easily available at a big box store and some canvas or nylon. These would be portable, but heavy enough that they can resist the wind. The ends of the two by fours can dig into the ground and help hold them in place. They could also be anchored with tent stakes, but it's a way of, of utilizing the outdoor spaces so that you can create these outdoor classrooms. These parents, they became, they become the walls. They become the object around which the students gather. In a meeting point, the parasols could be uh, marked for each class. There could be flags, et cetera. Um, athletics paint from the, the athletics department could be used to mark the field and create social distancing circles or other designs to help the students kind of know where to gather and uh, place themselves so that it can be at a safe distance, which uh, in the outdoors is easy enough. And in, these could also be utilized in a gym space, uh, indoors or large gathering area in a similar manner, but perhaps using uh, tape or some other temporary uh, floor marking materials. There's another, another angle on this. Uh, following the, the review shred, the mid review, um, there's, all right, someone's got a phone on. There we go. Um, we can uh, add some technological advantages. We can scale this up if needed. So it starts as a basic idea that can be upgraded and changed as needed and can even become a permanent base. You can see here we can add solar. We could add, we could add uh, the projector screen or the whiteboard screen to help complete the classroom. And USB charging ports, we're obviously asking these kids to use iPads and tablets for a lot of their learning. And they're gonna bring those to the school with them also, and in addition to the distance education. And you can use these in the outdoor classrooms. In the back, we're getting a peek at the faux tree. It's a slightly more permanent idea that I had um, for the schools that have a bigger budget or have the space to start permanently creating outdoor classrooms like they did in the uh, Spanish flu epidemic in the early 1900s in Finland. Um, creating mobile desk and adju adjustable desk again with simple dimensional lumber and materials that can be picked up over a weekend um, can be arranged to create different shade patterns and branches can be added or removed angles changed to suit each environment as needed so that's our quick and dirty uh, stupid simple presentation for <laughs> that can be plugged into any of these other plans to create uh, opportunities to segregate create groups, create teams, and control entry into uh, the schools. So thank you, and we welcome your questions. Uh, this is Jack. I, I really appreciated both of these schemes when we saw them um, the first time around, but I also want to commend both of you for how you've continued to develop them and refine them and to make them better than they were even before. These are, these are excellent ideas. Well, thank you. Alex, uh, I really like the uh, playfulness of uh, coral reef and stuff like that. I think this is the kind of things that uh, uh, really bring the cultural aspect to uh, something, making the best out of a difficult situation. I'll take two. I'll take two. 
<laughs> yeah, this is Mike. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate what, what Terry just said. I think that playfulness is something that's really critically important because kids are under so much stress these days in their classrooms and, and at, you know, being sequestered at home. I know my kids, I've got 13 year old twin sons. They're just, you know, going crazy at home. So anything that is like this, that's really playful, I think is, is fantastic. I myself would love to walk through a coral reef into my office. So I like to order one from my office. Thank you. Good job guys. Thank you. Yeah, I like the way you came together. I, I think a lot of people don't know that you were two separate groups early on, and I think you did a real nice job uh, blending the, the ideas of both of uh, your individual uh, projects together. So uh, congratulations, you did a really, really nice job. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you, sir. So I'm gonna share um, probably somewhat of a controversial perspective, um, and it might have to do with the information that I'm getting at the national board level. Um, so I serve on the National AIA Board, and um, one of the results of the, um, um, the uh, demonstrations related to uh, racial um, inequity across our country, um, uh, some of the users are pointing out to us as architects that um, the idea of creating difference or um, protective sort of um, things that you have to pass through, security, um, can make students feel like they're being profiled um, or that it's less welcoming because they feel like they're being singled out. Um, and so I think we need to consider those things when we're creating um, any kind of shading device or any kind of process where it creates a transition. Um, so, you know, um, one of the things we should be considering when we design schools is how do we make them feel open? How do we make them feel uh, welcoming in that regard? So uh, if I were to offer any criticism at all, Alexandra, it would be the scale of your object might want to be a little bit larger. So it doesn't necessarily feel like you're being constricted as much as it is like providing opportunities for you to pass through. I think more like, um, going to a Columbus crew match where there are a series of these things and you mm -hmm. feel like it's more um, um, equitable, equitably distributed, but not one thing. Mm -hmm. So I think yours would be really interesting um, if it was um, a series of them and they were able to relate to one another. And I think um, that might actually make it less, make people feel like they're less singled out. So it's just something really interesting to consider. Yeah, and yeah, I think that's a good point. I think in general, there would need to be multiple just to keep the line moving. But I am one of the students who used to go through a metal detector every morning for seventh through 12th grade. And we had this long line winding through the gym and I was talking to my friends and they're like, yeah, we totally skipped the line. Why did you wait in the line? But there, there was a comment of like, that's not a very welcoming, yay, we get to walk through the gym and then take all our stuff out and go through the metal detector. So. Yeah, I, I see your point and um, I do, yeah, a larger space can make that feel a little more welcoming. Right. At least, the yeah. unfortunate, an unfortunate accommodation of reality in America. So. I can imagine uh, integrating, uh, I mean, it's, if it's scaled up also, uh, integrating technology, like uh, when you go to the gas pump and now there's, you know, oh, the yeah. weather plan or commercials or something like that, just to, uh, make it, uh, I mean, I, I think the, the notion of uh, adding music was really good. And there was an idea with a projector, projecting images and that constant change. Yeah. I had one other thought too, which kind of combines the first um, presentation that we saw, which were related to objects. One of the things I thought was so interesting about that pr presentation is how they consider the user interface. And we also saw the middle presentation, which had to do with, um, high technology use. So can I, I can imagine your objects being impacted with um, technologies where, you know, as you walk by them, maybe they change color or the students have an opportunity to interact with them as well, which might be really cool for young students and make them feel less intimidated by the process. 
Because, you know, when they sort of like their shoes that light up, I mean, I don't know if those are in fashion anymore, but when my sons were young. Oh, yes, they are. <laughs> okay. So it's sort of like that, where the student gets an opportunity to feel like they're engaging in that kind of a... And there's those experience. the projections where you can step on them and the images move based on where you step. Yeah, that would be super cool. Yeah. 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 Maybe, maybe in Dublin schools, we can... <laughs> No, this is all going to be funded with um, public tax dollars distributed <laughs> evenly. Oh, that's how. <laughs> right, guys. So we're bumping up against our one thirty uh, timeline here. I, I just want to thank everyone that uh, joined us as a guest today. We really appreciate your time. We hope you uh, were inspired and learned a few things. Um, I encourage you, if, if you have more questions, I, I guess I would like to volunteer our, our presenters today to be a resource to you to continue the conversation if you have thoughts or questions. Um, we're going to ask that everyone that presented today, uh, please send their um, presentation to Kate um, so we can, we can get those documented. And then this is being recorded today as well, so we're going to try to put this out um, on our channel so that we can kind of spread our knowledge that we Put together today so uh thanks to the team also who presented and, and the ones that, that were not selected uh, we appreciate your efforts uh, we just had to streamline things a bit today to keep it uh, running on time so with that if there's any closing comments uh from from the previous jurors uh, i know we have a few of the fellows on the on the line here but i um, thought we'd kind of wrap it up um, see where it goes. i want to just say how impressive this has been today. I mean, just the amount of work put in and the thoughts. Um, I'm sort of overwhelmed on, on how detailed people dived into this and really took it so seriously. So kudos to everybody who was involved. And I have Absolutely. a request of everybody on the call. Um, I think this information is so necessary. We have a job to do to help distribute this information. This needs to get to teachers, it needs to get to districts, um, and I think they're very thirsty for it. So we should do our jobs to help um, get this uh, to be noted and, and uh, embedded in our culture here.